بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله صلوات الله والسلام عليه تسليما كثيرا أما بعد فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محتفاتها وكل محتفة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار Today inshallah we're going to begin the class that uh, we've announced a number of times concerning the qawaid of fiqh, the fiqh principles that will help an individual to comprehend aspects of his religion and how to deal with people in his environment, in his life. He may not have all of the Quran memorized. He may not have a lot of hadith memorized and committed to memory. But if he comprehends and he understands these fiqh principles, he'll position himself to be able to live a life in which he'll, insha'Allah ta'ala, maximize the benefits that uh, are there for him and to minimize uh, or instead eliminate unnecessary problems, insha'Allah. So let me first say that uh, there are many, 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 many principles that come to us. This class is not designed to get deep into these principles, nor are we going to deal with all of them. We'll deal with five of the most important ones, the most important five. And from these five, each and every one of them, they have other principles that come as branches. And they also can be many, but we're not going to deal with all of that. We just want to touch the surface, inshallah, give you the principle, the proof of the principle, and how do we apply it in our lives today. So the first thing that we want to mention, inshallah, is that that word, the qawaid is the plural of al-qa'idah, al-qa'idah. And al-qa'idah with an ayn, it means the foundation of something. Asas, al-shay, asas al bina the qaida or the qawaid, al fiqhi al qawaid is the plural. Qaida is the singular. It means the foundation of something, anything. Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, wa id yarfa'u Ibrahimu al qawaid min al bayti wa Ismail. And remember when Ibrahim, along with his son Ismail, when they erected the foundation of the Kaaba. So that ayat and the usage of the word al-qawaid proves that the meaning of the word qaida is plural qawaid is the foundation of something linguistically. So if we're talking about the qawaid of al-fiqh, they're the foundations of fiqh, the principles of fiqh that uh, need to be understood, comprehended, inshallah. And for being fair and just, out of the four madahib, that are well known, it was the Ahnaf who have the oldest madhab, the most ancient of the four madhab that we know of today. They were the ones who were the first people to, their ulama, the main ulama from amongst them. They were the first people who dealt with this issue. And that's a testament and it's a proof of the khair that the ulama of the ahnaf brought to the table in terms of al-Islam. And I want to warn the people, warn you brothers, remind you brothers, that when we look at our brothers who are Hanafi, and they are muta'asibun, mutashaddidun on their madhab, like those who are in Birmingham, in the UK, people will insist, I mean, they'll Break your neck over an Imam Abu Hanifa if you say something that's true about him. But if something is said about Abu Bakr and Umar, they won't have anything to say. They won't bat an eye. 
sometimes in hating that thing and we hate it. We hate that characteristic in the Muslim to be muta'asib. Even to the Prophet وسلم, we are not muta'asib to him. If someone said something that was true about him, we're not going to be muta'asib and say, no, that didn't happen. And it actually happened. But the point here is the dislike that a person may have for that asabiya and that staunch stance that many of them take that thing that they have where they think it's the madhab of Abu Hanifa but it's not and they're doing those things and it's not the madhab of Imam Abu Hanifa don't allow your dislike for that don't allow your hatred for that to cause you to hate the Hanafi madhab or the ulama of the ahnaf rahimuhumullahu ta'ala wa hafidhuhumullah they have a madhab and the imam of that madhab has done a lot for al-Islam. From the ahnaf are ulama kibar. And from the ahnaf are awliya of Allah. Past and present. Walking on the face of the earth. Another issue is they don't have a monopoly on this asabiya. It's not only the ahnaf who have it. Every madhab has that. Malikis. The shafi'is. As well as the hanbalis. And each madhab has a black history. Each madhab, they have a black history in terms of how they dealt with people who are ulama from the other madhabs. The Hanabila were going to kill people because they were not on the Hanbali madhab, but they brought the truth. And the Hanbalis were going to break his neck, burnt his house down. And all of the madhab had people who were like that. But the imams of the madhab, for the most part, they weren't like that. They were not like that. So the Ahnaf were the first people who their madhab is the oldest madhab out of the four. And also their ulama were the first ones to start writing about this issue. Then came after them some of the ulama of the other madhab. And each madhab has books about these principles. Each madhab. Some of these principles are agreed upon. And some of them, there's ikhtilaf in them. We're going to stay away from all of that ikhtilaf because the issue itself can be complicated and we don't want to make it complicated. We just want to hand you something that will make practicing Islam, inshallah, and dealing with people and your job and relatives a bit easier, inshallah. So from those books that were written in the other madahib, and there are many, but the most famous ones, because many of the brothers were contacting the masjid who in turn contact me to ask, are we going to use a particular book? All of the books about the fiqh principles are in Arabic. And the majority of our students, as you look around, are not Arabs. So why use a book? It's going to be long and it's going to be complicated. We're just going to pick the principles that it, that's it and deal with them. But it is important to know in the introduction that all of the madahib, they dealt with this. Like in the madahib, of the madhab of Al-Imam Malik. Probably the main book for this particular issue is the book that is called Kitab Al-Faruq. Al-Faruq, not Faruq, Al-Faruq by the scholar and the Imam Ahmed ibn Idris, Al-Qirafi. He's well known as Al-Qirafi, Shihab al-Din Al-Qirafi. He died in the year 600. And 84. It's probably the best book in the Maliki Madhab in these issues. But there are others. Then after that, we have the Shafi'i Madhab. And probably the most famous, the best book was Qawaid al Ahkam. Qawaid al Ahkam. And that was by Imam Abdul Aziz ibn Abdul Salam. Laqab was Izzuddin. His name, Abdul Aziz, Abdul Aziz Ibn Abdul Salam. He was born in 660, or he died 660. And then finally, the book Al Qawaid for the Hanbali Madhab by the student of Sheikh Al Islam Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Rajab wrote that book, Kitab Al Qawaid. And Ibn Taymiyyah died 66 or 795. 795. Each and every one of these madahib, ikhwani, they have other books, especially the Shafi'i madhab and Imam al-Suyuti have one of the most important books, al-Ishtiba wa nadair but the ones that I mentioned to you are probably the most famous and the most beneficial 
in terms of gathering all of the stuff. I just wanted to show and share with you that the ulama of Islam, they were the ones who delved into this issue and they were the ones who pulled out for us the benefits of what we're going to deal with. Concerning these principles, I told you there are many. We're only going to deal with five. And each one of them have other principles that come from it. So the five that we're going to deal with that I want you to write down, inshallah, as you've been writing, number one is the principle al-ada muhakkamatun. Al-ada muhakkamatun. That the customs, the customs of the people, it has consideration. It's mu'tabara. It can make halal haram, halal. It can make haram haram. The customs of the people, they can make something halal or haram. They have to be considered. You want to practice something of the sunnah that is not the custom of the people. And the people are ignorant about that thing. You should leave that thing that you want to practice until you develop the people to appreciate that particular sunnah. And we're going to come to this inshallah because every group of people, they have customs. Some that are universal, everybody shares in them. And some that are Islamic, and some that are African, and some that are Arabian, and some that are Asian, and so forth and so on. So this is the first one we're going to deal with out of the five, inshallah. Al-Ada Muhakkamatun. The second one that we're going to deal with, inshallah, is another very important principle. Al-Mashakkatu Tajribu Taysir. The difficulty in the religion. If things are difficult. Difficulty in this theme, the principle is... Difficulty draws to it easiness. Something is difficult. Islam, this principle shows that the difficulty has a magnetic thing where it draws to itself ease from the Quran and the Sunnah. That's a principle in dealing with people, Muslims and non-Muslims. When you're living in an environment that is not Islamic and people are attacking and so forth and so on, there's a way to deal with the situation. If you're compelled and you're forced to eat something haram, there's a way to deal with the situation. So we'll come to that at its time, inshallah. Number three. Number three. Number three is Al-Amur Bimaqasidiha Issues are based upon the goals and the objectives. We're going to explain that, inshallah. Al-Amur bimaqasidiha. The issues, they're based upon their goals and their objectives. The intent, I guess you can say. Issues are based upon the intent. And this is extremely important when we come to it and we deal with it in our practical lives. The meaning will come clearer to you, inshallah. Someone who speaks Arabic and they're sitting there and they hear Al Amur Bimakasidiha, he gets a better comprehension if he doesn't even know what you're talking about. The Arabic language helps him to understand what direction you're going in. But it's hard to define this, to explain it, to translate it without examples. So it's down the line, inshallah. So you write it down the best way that you can, and inshallah, when we cross that bridge, its meaning will become apparent to you. Al Amur Bimakasidiha. Things are based upon the, their goals and the objectives. Number four is what we mentioned the other day, last Saturday, this past Saturday. Ad-darar yuzal. That harm should be raised up. In this religion, harm is raised up. Anyone who's being hurt, where there is any harm, any problems, in this religion came to take that off of people. And its religion didn't legislate for people to be in a per permanent, perpetual state of difficulty and problems and being hurt physically, mentally, spiritually. Anytime there's harm, this religion said people have to be taken out of that situation either with their own hands or with the help of others in the society. And the last one, very important one as well, al yaqeen la yazulu bishak. Al yaqeen clarity, clarity is not eliminated as a result of doubt. So something that you know is clear, it's not eliminated 
because of doubt. And again, as you sit there and you hear that, you may not know well, what is that talking about. But again, with the examples, it'll become clear. We know that this man was born to a Muslim mother and father, and we have no doubt about that because they were born in Al Medina. And the son who's with us, he's doing things that cause people to maybe doubt his Al Islam. We see him every single day at the pub across the street. We never see him praying. Uh, and other issues that cause us to doubt. But the fact that he was born in Medina, where all the Muslims are, the fact that he was born to a mother and a father, the fact that we don't have any clear evidence that he went outside of Al-Islam, that surety, that yaqeen, that he was a Muslim, it is not destroyed based upon doubt. So if the people who understood the importance of this principle, if they understood it, they wouldn't make takfir on people just like that. Just, just like that, he's doing something that is an issue of kufr. So he's a non-Muslim. Hey, relax. You need to get the basics of Islam before you even deal with this principle. And it's a lot of uh, things that happen in our everyday lives. This is an extreme example. Before we deal with this principle, the takfiri, so-called jihadi, we're going to tell him, you need to know that this is a major sin, what you're doing. This is a major sin. And you're going overboard. You're being oppressive. Yaqeen is not eliminated. It's not raised up because of a shak, doubt. So from those five, each one of them has five, six, seven, eight other principles. But we're not going to deal with all of them. We're going to deal with those principles that we feel and deem are the ones we need to know on a basic level without making the issue too complicated. After that, Ikhwani, we come to the issue itself about Al-Ada is muhakkama. The culture of the people is considered. Now, first thing you have to understand about this principle is that. First thing about this principle. First thing is that every principle has exceptions to the rule. Every principle. For the most part. There is an exception to every rule. For the most part. Not every rule, but there is an exception to every rule. For the most part. And this has an exception. The people's culture is not considered when it goes against the religion. The people's culture is not appreciated when it goes against the Quran and the Sunnah. When that thing that's being done is a bad thing. This is one of the problems that all of the prophets and all of the messengers had when they came to their people. Their people preferred their culture over the religion. They preferred their culture and they found it difficult to give up their culture over the religion. And that's why Quraysh used to always say things like, our fathers didn't do that. Our forefathers didn't do that. If it is said to them, leave alone what your grandfathers and your forefathers used to do, they were saying, no, we, we we're not going to do that. So I want to ask you guys, in Al-Islam, in Al-Islam, from the culture of some Africans is, to put lines in the face to show what tribe you come from. Is that permissible? Can we say the culture said it's okay so we do it? Can we do that? No, because mutilating the body is not permissible. Harming the Muslim is not permissible. Harm has to be raised up. The circumcision that some Muslims and non-Muslims give the baby girl, that circumcision that they give, the Pharaonic circumcision, per se, hey, this is from our culture, and it's a sign, we even call it a tohr, Purity. Hey, I don't care what you call it. The Prophet ﷺ said, you shouldn't hurt people, you shouldn't harm people. None of you believes to you love for your brother what you love for yourself. And as a father, I don't want anybody doing that to me. Me, I don't want you doing that to me. So how can I allow that for my daughters? So the man comes and says, hey, the women, they overwhelm me. The women, they overpowered me. No, you have to stand up against your women in that issue. So there are many issues of culture. In some parts of the Muslim world, in Africa, if you're an elderly person, you're an older person, 70, 80, he's like really old. When he comes into the room, people bow down to him. I mean, literally bow down. Some bow like Rukur, some lay out on the floor, and some bend down like you just put a, put a dip in your knee and you bow down. And that is a sign of respect to the elder. And in the mind of the elder, you're not doing any ibadah to him. He doesn't see himself as being Allah and you're trying to worship him with Rukur or Sajda. He doesn't see that. 
What he sees is you're respecting him. It's like saying mister. If you say to someone mister, it's just with a sign of respect, that's all. But because the religion said don't bow down to people, then this culture, this, this, this uh, cultural uh, activity is not permissible. So the culture is only muhakkama when it doesn't go against the religion. If the religion was quiet about it, then no problem. And you're going to see many examples. And we told you about this. It comes into play when we deal with things like the Prophet, he had braids in his hair, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But if you go to some of our villages and where we come from, even here, having braids in your hair in our culture, in the culture, people, they, they, they don't accept that. So don't do it. The sunnah of wearing your thobe halfway to your shin. That's the place where the thobe should be. Whatever you wear in your lower extremities, pants, thobe, izar, whatever you wear, the Prophet said that the thing that's on the lower part, the izar, whatever you're wearing, the best place for it is halfway. And if you don't want it there, go down a little. If you don't want it there, go down a little. If you don't want it there, go down a little. But beware of the ankle bone. But the point is, he started off by saying at the halfway, that's the best place. But in our culture, I don't know any culture, Muslim or non-Muslim, well, I can't say that, can't say that. In our culture, if you wear your pants halfway to your leg, it's the sunnah. But your co-worker is going to look at you, you're going to be a fitna. Your pants halfway to your leg. So it's, it's going to be a fitna. So before doing it, before doing that sunnah, you have to introduce the people. You have to teach the people. You have to educate the people. And don't just do it and say it's the sunnah. So concerning this particular issue, let us give you a number of the proofs. And they are many. They are many in the Quran and even more in the authentic sunnah of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Imam al-Qurtabi, Maliki scholar, tafsir of the Quran. And his tafsir of the Quran focuses on the ayat of the Quran that deal with fiqh, the ahkam of the Quran. He is not going to deal in depth with qul huwallahu ahad. He's not going to deal with that. He's going to deal with the ayats of divorce. He's going to deal with the ayats of inheritance. He's going to deal with those ayat that are talking about halal and haram. And he's going to dig into those. When it comes to alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, he's not going to deal with that too much like some of the other scholars who want to give you the overall tafsir of the Qur'an. His focus is on the fiqh of the Qur'an. Anyway, as it relates to the culture, he said that in the Qur'an, Allah Ta'ala identifies the Qur'an, the culture, by using the word ma'roof, ma'roof. You have to know this. And ma'roof, because culture, the word is urf, urf, ain ra fa ma'ruf urf is from that word so the culture is identified with the word ma'ruf number two culture is also identified by the word al-urf urf itself urf culture and number three culture is also identified by the word arifa arifatun arifatun with a ta and marbut at the end. Ismu fa'il arifatun. So some of those ayat, and there are many, just did a few of them for you. The first ayat is Surat An Nisa, number four, ayat number 19. Allah Ta'ala said, Wa ashiruhunna bin ma'roof. Live with your wives with ma'roof. Live with your wives and your children and your family with and ma'roof. With what is known as the culture. And what is the culture? The culture is all of those things that people who have good hearts, they have their fitrah, they're clean in the way they think, everything that the people consider to be good and pure and wholesome and, and beneficial. No one has any doubt about this behavior and that activity. This is a good thing. So the culture has many definitions, but it's what the people generally, generally consider to be good, wholesome, pure, 
No one is going to stand up and be against it because everybody collectively who are blessed with intellect and purity, we're not talking about the monsters and the criminals and the psychopaths. We're not talking about those people and what they think and like. We're not talking about them. We're talking about just the general good, decent human beings. What they consider, hey, that thing that you did is good. That, that's a good thing. Even if he doesn't know the delil from it, he's going to say this thing was a good thing. For an example, you put some water, community water thing, a water fountain somewhere, and you built a nice little thing and the water fountain is coming out, a nice thing on Coventry Road. No one's going to say this is a bad thing. Everybody's going to walk by and say it's a nice thing, this nice piece of art that they did, provided you didn't waste money, you didn't obstruct the way, and so forth and so on. So anyway, this ayat, it uses the word ma'ruf, where Allah Ta'ala told us, bin ma'ruf, live with your wives when you get married, with ma'ruf. Don't live with them like they're animals. Don't live with them under the poverty line. No. You marry this daughter, and you want to be a zahid. After the marriage, the father comes to the house, and no, they have been eating his bread and peanut butter. He has money, he could get more than that. The father says, hey, what, 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 why are you just subjecting my daughter to bread and peanut butter? He says, but the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a whole month would go by his house. Go by, a whole month. Uh, a, a, a moon and then the new moon, and all they had was water and dates. The father said, that was the culture. That was the condition back then. You are muhandis right now. You have a job. You are muhandis. You're a teacher. You're a professional. Why are you subjecting my daughter to water and peanut butter sandwiches? So this ma'ruf that you live with them is that basic thing that every person with common sense says, this is the standard of living for a newly married man. And this is the standard of living of a man who has this job. So that's the meaning of the ayah. Another ayat of Khwani similar to it is Surah Al-Baqarah, ayat number 228. Allah Ta'ala mentioned about the women, ma'ruf, and the wives have what is similar to what is upon them with ma'ruf. The husbands have rights over their wives with what is ma'ruf. I can't expect my wife to stand up over me all night in the summertime because we don't have any air condition and she's my wife. So she has to stand over me and fan me all through the night. And I say to her, hey, the delil for what I'm asking you to do is that the prophet told the men, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, these women are like slaves. He didn't say they were. And the hukuk that the husband has over them, he said they are like slaves. And he was just trying to show the tremendous level of responsibility that the lady has to the husband. So the husband uses that ayah. You can't go to Jannah till you give me my rights. And I'm hot right now, so I'm about to go to sleep. I want you to stand up with the fan and don't sit down. And Allah told you to do that. No. The culture said, this is not acceptable in the culture, someone to make the lady do that. So Allah said, the women have rights similar to those that are on them. So the husband, he has rights, and that woman, she has rights as well, that she should be treated decently. All of her relatives, when going to the party, going to the nikah, going to the aqiqah, going to the eid, all of them, they have nice clothes, new clothes. And this man's wife, she has the same dress, two dresses that he married her with 20 years ago. And her shoes, you know the heels in the back, they're going to the side and the front. Are, they're talking. They're like this. And then the brother says, Hey, it's the dunya. We say, No, Achi. Ma'ruf. Ma'ruf is for you to realize, Hey, it's the Eid. Buy your kids gift. Don't be tough. Don't be rough. Don't be mean like that. Relax. Take it easy. My wife, I'm a Muslim, but my parents are kuffar. They're kuffar. So when I go home, my wife... She wears niqab. When she goes into my home, when she goes into my home, I have to not bend the rules, but I have to realize, I have to deal with it. Okay, that's my sister's boyfriend, not her husband. And that's your mother's boyfriend. That's not your father. And he's around for your wife. You have to look at this situation 
and don't do things that are strange. Just be, use common sense. This is where this issue comes into play. The more you know, the more you'll be able to do it. So some people, they're too rough and too tough, where the girl is sitting in front of her mother's boyfriend of 40 years with the niqab on, because the husband said, he's not your father, he's not her wife, he's not her husband, so no, you have to leave the niqab on. Hey, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Now, if he wants to insist, I'm not going to fight him because technically what he's saying is true. What he's saying is true, technically. But Al-Islam doesn't want that difficulty on the people. From the Quran, Ikhwani, is the statement of Allah Ta'ala, خُذُ الْعَفُ وَأْمُلْ بِالْعُرْفُ وَأَعْرَدْ عَنَ الْجَاهِلِينَ The next ayah uses the word urf. Allah said, overlook and forgive people and work by the culture, work by an urf and the word urf is here, not ma'ruf urf, work by the urf work by what is universally accepted the culture work by it, and you're going to see in the hadith how it becomes even clearer inshallah, so the ayat is clearly showing us the culture has a position in al-islam because Allah used the word he said, work by al-urf. Wa'mul bil-urf. Order them with al-urf. So in our culture, in our culture, don't call your mother and your father by their first names. Don't call them like that. Is there an ayat that said that? Is there a hadith that said that? No. But the culture is, if we were sitting together and your child came in and he said to you, hey, Abu Hanifa, we're going to look at the kid and say, wow, that's a problem. Everybody's going to think that, except the new age families, the new age family. The family today, the boy and the girl get married, maybe they got married two, three years ago. And these next, the next generation, that's how they're going to be talking to their parents. Because it's one of the signs of Yom Qiyamah, that the slave girl will give birth to a mother, where the mother becomes the child and the child becomes the mother. So the child is going to be saying pretty soon, Hey, Ma, go and time out. Hey, Ma, you go to time out. Instead of the mother saying, hey, you, you go to time out. They say, no, you go to time out, Ma. What are you talking about? And that is approaching because we see how people deal with their parents and their relatives. That's us in this masjid. Another ayah, ikhwani, and there are many, many, many. In Surat An-Nur, Surat An-Nur, ayah number 58. This is a really important ayah as well. All of the ayahs are important. Number 58. Allah Ta'ala mentioned, Ya ayyul ladheena amanu. Liyasta'dhinakum al-ladheena malakat aymanukum wal-ladheena lam yablughu al-hulma minkum thalatha maratin min qabli salat al-fajri wa hina tad'una thiyabakum min al-zahira wa min ba'di salat al-isha. O you who believe, let those who your right hands possess Whenever they want to come in on you in your private chambers, let them knock and let them seek permission to come in at three times. In the morning at Salatul Fajr, when you take your thobes off, your clothes off, and at the siesta, during the siesta time, Dhuhr time, around that time, mid-afternoon, and at the time of Al-Isha, the time of Al-Isha, so that is Surat An-Nur, ayah number 58. Where's the culture in that? The culture in that, Ikhwani, is any and every group of people that you find in the civilized world, as they say, in a so-called uncivilized world, is that these are the three times that everybody has taken off their clothes. Whether they live in cold environments, hot environments, you tend to lighten up in terms of what you're wearing at these three times. So Islam is saying... When people take their clothes off, what your right hands possess, your workers, your slaves, these people during that time, your children, they shouldn't be allowed to see your aura. So, therefore, the culture is, wherever you go, that in the morning time, people don't have their clothes on. At noon time, around that time, everybody's taking a nap. Every group of people put their children to bed at this time. In the Arab world till today, People are still, it's part of the schedule to go to sleep at this time. 
And that was the sunnah of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And obviously at the end of the day. So again, Al-Imam Al-Qurtabi, those other ulama who deal with the tafsir of the Quran with the fiqh emphasis, they delved into this particular ayat. And that's from the many benefits of this ayat. The adab of al-istidhan. Why is it mentioned at time? Is that only peculiar to us, the Muslims? Only the Muslims? No. When Ethiopians came into the religion, Persians came into the religion, when Romans came into the religion, they knew these three times as well. So they didn't have to make any adjustments. Lastly, from these adilla and from the proofs, is Surah Al-Ma'ida, ayat number 89. Al-Ma'ida, ayat number 89. I hope you guys go back and you look at these ayat, inshallah, and you contemplate them and you consider them. Allah Ta'ala mentioned, لا يؤاخذكم الله باللغو في أيمانكم ولكن يؤاخذكم بما أقدتم الأيمان فكفارته إطعام عشرة مساكين من أوسة ما تطعمون أهلكم أو كسوتهم إلى آخرها. Allah said, Allah does not hold you people accountable for when you swear, but you didn't really mean it. It's level. Wallahi, I'm not going. Come on, man. Come on. Wallahi, I'm not going. Wallahi. Come on, Aki. Relax. It's going to be okay. He said, all right, I'm going. Allah doesn't hold you accountable for that because you didn't mean it in that way. You didn't mean it like, Wallahi, if I go, I'm fasting two months consecutively. He didn't mean it like that. He just meaning, you know, I have an exam, I can't go. Come on, Akhi, it's only going to be a series, it's going to take a break, get some, Wallahi, man, I'm not going, Wallahi, I'm not going. And But they keep pressing, then he gets up and he goes. Does he have to pay a fidya? No. Allah Ta'ala said in this ayat, Allah does not hold you accountable for this type of swearing that you say. But he holds you accountable for what you really meant and implied. So if you're serious and then you go against what you said, and you were serious, but then you broke it. You said, Wallahi, I swear I'm not going to do it. Then you went and did it, and you meant it that way. Allah said the penalty for that is that you have to pay. You have to feed 10 poor people. You have to feed 10 people similar to the way you feed your own family. Similar way. Do you have to feed 10 people the way a rich person can feed 10 people? Do you have to feed 10 people to the way a very, very poor person in the dirt has to feed a poor, uh, uh, a poor person? No, you feed it. You feed the people in accordance to your ability. So the ayat, the ayat took the issue back to the urf of the people, the, the, the culture, the ability, the, the level of the people. So the rich person... He gives two, muddain, two. And the poor one, who's in this situation, only gives one. So Allah gave that ruling, how much do you give? Like when we are doing the uh, zakatul fitr and these types of things, when you make mistakes in the religion and you have to feed these people. And there are a lot of things where this comes into play. There was a companion, his name is Kaab ibn Ujra. He was performing a hajj and in his head, he had lice jumping all over the place. And you can't cut your hair until a particular day. But he started hajj off and he had this problem all over his head. And to leave it like that, it was bothering him and bothering others. So an ayat was revealed in this regard. And the Prophet told him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, cut your hair off. And then you can fast or you can feed people. Or you give sadaqah. But how does he feed people? He feeds people according to what your ability is. So it goes back to the urf. Because the ayat wasn't, the religion didn't make it definitive. So those are some of the ayat of the Quran. And there are many. Now for the sunnah. And the sunnah is even clearer. Khwani, about the urf of the people. It is muhakkama. From the first examples is what happened with Abu Sufyan and his wife Hind. May Allah be pleased with them. Hen, the wife, came and said, Ya Rasulullah, Abu Sufyan, my husband, he's bakhil. He doesn't want to spend. He doesn't give me any money. So I'm asking you, Ya Rasulullah, can I take from his money without his knowledge? Can I take from his money without his knowledge? Because that's maybe stealing. She doesn't know. 
So the husband, he controls all of the money in the house, all of it. And at the end of the week, end of the month, whatever, he gives the wife the money, go shopping with the money and bring me back my change. So she came and said, he is holding on to all of the money and it's not enough for me and my child. What should I do? The Prophet said to her, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Khudi ma yakfiki wa waladiki bi ma'roof. Take from his money what is enough, what is enough for you and your child with ma'roof. Yes, you can take from his money, but take what is ma'roof. So I want to ask you guys about the culture right here. If the husband has 1,000 pounds saved up and he's stingy and the wife knows this hadith and she's not receiving from him enough to take care of her knees and her baby's knees. This is a fact. But she has access to his bank account and to his money. If she were to take out of that money, according to this hadith, she were to take 15 pounds, 10 pounds out of the thousand. Do you think the husband will be upset? Anybody, you think the husband going to be upset? He's not going to be upset. Because that's ma'roof. No one's going to be upset. The one who's upset about that, something is wrong. Something is wrong. He's the exception to the rule. But even if one of us, if we were like that, we found out she took 10 pounds, 15 pounds, 20 pounds, and he's stingy, but he has a, a grand. It's not going to be a problem. But if the lady went to the bank and said, Hadith, Abu Sufyan and Hen, Take what's enough for you and your kid. She took from the 1,900 pounds and left 100. Is the husband going to be upset? Everybody's going to say yes. They're going to be upset. Because that's, it's ma'roof that she went overboard. It's too much. So this is a delil of an uruf in that the Prophet allowed her, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yes, take what is enough for you with what is ma'roof. Don't go overboard. So the ma'roof is important. It's just common sense. The husband is usually the imam of his house in the Islamic household, usually. And I think that's the case with everyone. And no matter how strong the husband is in terms of having respect and power and the sulta and his sultan of his house, still every wife, every wife is going to give her husband a hard time because she's a lady. She's a human being. She has her own point of view. The best, most docile, laid back. The, the best of them, she's going to get upset. Hormones and she get upset. Everybody has that. Nobody know. everybody has that. But there is a level, common sense, an urf. So when she reads these ahadith, she has to use her brain. It's permissible for the husband to put water on his wife to wake her up for the hadjit. But she may have a lot of ibadah. And her husband is not that kind of guy who does a lot of ibadah. And the hadith allowed her to do that to her husband as well. But she has to consider that. My husband is not the type of guy that I can throw water on his face to wake him up for no prayer. Because if I throw water on his face, it's the sunnah. But it's going to have a bad effect on me and the whole situation. And this is how the whole society is. The hadith said, you can do that. This is from the sunnah. But you have to weigh the ramifications. What's going to happen? The, back, the, the backlash, the blowout from it. So that's one delil. Second one. And what was collected by Imam Abu Dawood? Listen to what happened. One of the companions, his name is al bara ibn Azib, radiallahu anhu. He had some camels. And his camels went into the bustan, the hadiqa the garden of a man, of a group of people. When his camels went inside, they destroyed the place. They ate from the trees, knocked the water all over the place. They stepped all in the place. They just messed the whole garden up. It's a real incident. Someone has to pay. You have damaged our property. So they went to the Prophet wasallam. Now, if this happened, and one of you had to judge, right now as you see the picture, you can imagine, this is the garden. A row of trees, nice, beautiful trees. And then another row and another row. And between the row, there's the water that's flowing. Beautiful sound, birds in the trees, everything. Nice place. 
Inside the garden, there are apples, pineapples, and it's manicured and it's beautiful. And here this man's camels come in and they're having a party. And they destroy the place and they leave. Someone comes to you and say, judge. You're going to say, this is easy. You done destroyed this man's property. You have to give all the money for all of this. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam looked at this situation and he said, in this case, the people who own the property, they are responsible for their property during the daytime. And the people who own these kinds of animals, they're responsible for their animals during the nighttime. So now what we have to do is we have to look. When did those animals go inside of that garden? Because during the daytime, the guy who's got the property, he's going to have workers, he's going to have guards. It's his responsibility to protect his place. That's his job. He has a worker here, worker there, and he pays them for that. And these animals, the nature of these animals is that they move around. That's the nature. You can't stop that. They're going to move around. People are going to be walking with their animals in the desert, through the desert, through your bypass, your property. How are you going to expect you're not there to protect it? You're going to, they're just going to stop because it's your property? So during the daytime, you're responsible. But during the nighttime, it can't be expected that that guy is going to be there, living there, or that he has to get a worker to live there. No, it's the nighttime. If he has a worker there, a worker may be one, a few, it's difficult. Whereas the one who owns these animals, now you have to be responsible for your animal at the nighttime. So if the animals go in there and they destroyed it during the daytime, the guy who owned the place, that was his bad. That was a bad move on his part. They call it ihmal in Arabic. Ihmal, taqsir. The, uh, he fell short of the mark. That's part of the risk. You know, rain coming down. Thunder, fire, earthquakes, those are part of the risk that you took. And the risk hit you in a bad way in this case. Allahu alam. But in the nighttime, if it were to happen. So why did the Prophet say that? What's the point? What's the proof? What's the proof here? Why is this a proof of the earth? Because the Nabi took the ruling back to what was well known about the life of the people. The life of the people. So that's another clear proof in Dalil of the Urf. Another situation, let me just give you these last two, inshallah. The another one is about weights and measurements. Weights and measurements. And the hadith that was collected by Imam Abu Dawood, as well as Imam Shafi in his Musnad, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Al waznu waznu ahli Makkata. Whenever there's an issue dealing with measurements and weights, we're Muslims. If there's an issue dealing with measurements and weights in his environment back then, especially, a dispute comes up about the measurement and the weights. He said, when it comes to this issue, as it relates to weights, the ruling will go back to what the people of Medina said. What is in their culture? What is in their environment? In Al-Islam, if there are disputes, discrepancies, misunderstandings, as it relates to weights and measurements, then the urf, the culture of the people of Mecca, we're going to deal with the mikyal, weighing things. And then wasn, and wasn, and wasn the weights, the weights, it will be with what the people of Mecca said. And the wisdom for that is the people of Medina, they were into agriculture. They went to the Nakhal, you know, date palm trees. They went to planting seeds. They went to vegetation. That's where their money came from. So therefore, you're going to always be weighing things. They are more equipped. They're more adept at that. They're more professional. Whereas the people of Medina, of Mecca, they were into business and trade, selling textiles, selling things like that. They didn't have those agricultural 
products and produce. They didn't have that. They went to money, paper money, gold, silver, clothes. They went to those things. So when it came to measurements, they were the ones who knew better than the people of Medina. So the Nabi clearly told the people in this particular hadith, judging by the expertise of the culture of the lives of both groups, if there are any discrepancies, any problems, then it goes back to the way I just said. He says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, about the Qur'an. He said about the Qur'an. If there is any ikhtilaf in the recitation, then it goes back to what the people of Quraysh, how they read the Qur'an and pronounced the words. It goes back to Quraysh. And that's really important as well. Because the Qur'an and the Sunnah, if you're looking for the description or the details of something, either the Qur'an, the Sunnah will make it clear, or the Arabic language. And if one of those three things don't make it clear, then you go to the earth of the people. It's going to be the Quran. It's going to make it clear. Chop their hand off. Well, this is the hand. Where do I chop the hand off from? The sunnah comes and shows you where you chop it off from. So there's no problem. No ishqal. So the Quran will make it clear how much, how long, how many. The sunnah will make it clear how much, how long, how many. If you don't have it in the Quran, the sunnah, the language of the Arabs. What is the beard? Don't shave your beard. Leave your beard. Okay, where does the beard begin? The Quran doesn't say that. The Sunnah doesn't say that. The language of the, of the Arabs tell you that this on your face right here is not your beard. That this under your neck is not your beard. So their language, their poetry, they came and it showed you. Now if the language doesn't tell you, then you go back to the earth of the people. Urf is important, very, very important. You want to get married? You want to get married? And the urf of the people is, okay, we're going to let you marry our daughter, but the first thing that you have to do is you have to bring the men, the father, the uncle, you have to bring them this type of clothes, and you have to bring them cola nuts. You have to bring them cola nuts. You got to bring those cola nuts. And you have to give her a, a, a suitcase, suitcase full of clothes. And then after that, after that, you have to do the walima. You have to do all of the walima. You, not us. You have to do the walima. You and your family. Maybe the girl side, maybe the boy side. That's just the culture. Then they tell the boy, okay, after you get married to our daughter, you can marry her, but you can't take her with you for three months. You just can come and see her for a few minutes, and then she's going to go. And that's the culture with some people. And the brother says, no, 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 no. Once I marry her, that is my wife. If their culture said, yeah, that's your wife, but that's how their culture is. So if that's the culture, that stuff is permissible. As long as it doesn't go against the religion. Last example we want to give, Ikhwani, and many can be given, is that women, women, women. Women have special situations and issues that deal with them. And as a result of that, the culture of the women may be different from the men or the men don't even have to deal with that issue. Like the woman is going to know more than the men who breastfed this child and who didn't breast, 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 breastfeed him. The woman, she knows, like for this is just an example, the birthday of her kids. She has four kids, five kids. Any of them has to go to the hospital, whatever. If she goes, they say, when was he born? She'll say 7.35 in the morning on such such a day. Gave him the whole thing. The father one day takes him. They say, when was your boy baby born? He says, I don't know. I'm not paying attention to that. I don't know when he was born. And that's how the men are. They're not paying attention to that. So women, they have a special culture. And men also have special culture. But we just want to deal with the women. When it came to the issues that were peculiar to women like their periods, Akramakumullah, the Prophet ﷺ referred it back to the culture that women know. Like the women who used to come to him and they used to say, Ya Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I'm still bleeding from my period. It's been a lot of days. I bleed 15, 20 days, and then it stopped. 
and then the next one, 30 days, and then it stopped. The next one, a month, the next, and what should I do? He told her, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, look back and wait for five or six days. Five or six days. And then make wudu for every prayer. So why did he say five or six days? Because there's some women who don't have this long extended bleeding. They bleed for seven days, eight days. Every month, eight days. And they get clean on the ninth day. Every month. Like clockwork. And some women, four days, four days, three days, and that's it. And there's nothing wrong with them. That's just how their, 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 their cycle is. But they are exceptions to the rule. The majority of the women, they're going to be between five, six, seven. The majority of them are going to be like that. So the Prophet told the lady, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not on one occasion, two occasions, a couple occasions, told the lady to do that. Just go back and look at five, six days. Why? Because that's the culture of the women. That's the culture of the women. And there are many examples of that as well. So anyway, I think you guys get the picture. So it's not important to give you a mu many examples. It's important that if you know this point, you'll know how to deal with people. So I'll give you an example, and then I'll open up the door, inshallah, for any questions you may have. The culture. There is a man, he owns some land. He owns animals. And Brother Zakaria is working for this man. Zakaria is working for this man. He's responsible for getting all of his camels from this car park all the way to the bull ring. That's his job. Got to get them camels over there. The guy who Zakaria works for, they have a very good relationship. He treats Zakaria as if he's his second father. He's very close to Zakaria's son, his father. And he loves him. And they have a nice relationship. They got love. He's working though. He's, he, he makes them work. But they got love and respect and everything. So now the question is, Zachariah is in his dilemma. He's tired. He wants to ride one of those camels from here to there. He wants to ride. But that's not part of the contract. That's not, and that's that man's property. That camel is that man's amana. It's amana. He never asked that man, can I ride your camel? But it is quite far going from here to there. And that is an animal that is responsible for transporting stuff. Now the question is, based upon the culture and the condition between them two, do you think it's okay to ride the animal? Or can someone come and say, hey, don't do that. Feel Allah, the man is serious. What do you guys think? Should he ride or he shouldn't ride? Put your hand up. He should ride. If you say it's okay for him to ride, put your hands up, put your hands up. All right, all right. That's the majority. And who says he shouldn't ride? Those are the mutashaddi doing right there. Those, those are the ka'i, the ka'i, the people. Shabab, Boko Haram. Those who say he shouldn't ride, you have a point of view. Because leave what you doubt for what you don't doubt won't be any problems. But because he knows even if this man came and saw me, it's not going to be a problem. So he can make a call at that particular moment. It wouldn't be a problem. But if he didn't like Zechariah and Zechariah didn't like him and he held Zechariah responsible for everything that he did and he made muhasaba on him, made him responsible for everything, everything, then Zechariah knows, don't ride this man's stuff. It's just common sense. Don't ride this man's stuff. Because now... I free myself from any blame. So this is what this particular thing is about, Ikhwani. You're going to always be in a situation where we have to look at the culture. And in these types of environments where there are non-Muslims and the people are living in a melting pot. Actually, we don't want to use that word anymore. I don't think it's politically correct. It's not Islamically correct to call it, call it a melting pot. They used that a long time ago. America is a melting pot. The UK is a melting pot. That suggests you put everything in the pot and it all melts and it, it all mixes. We're not mixing with you like that. Hey, we have, we have, a, we have clothes. We have a way we are. We'll, we'll take on board some things. The universal issues that the culture, everyone respects. Freedom of speech. Freedom of religion. Uh, respecting people and cleanliness and we, yes, we're part of that. But melting pot, 
where I, I melt my stuff into you and, and you don't know me and I don't know you. Nah. So we're going to call it, um, we're going to call it a fruit salad or something like that. We're not going to call it melting pot anymore. When we're in these environments right here, where the coach of the kofana is very tricky. If a man wants to wear a suit with a tie and a jacket, I'm not going to say to him, what are you doing? Because he's in the place. This is the culture. This is how we dress here. This is how we dress. So I remember a big sheikh. He's teaching in the Prophet's Masjid right now. A sheikh Abdul Razak al-Abad. He's a respected sheikh. When he came to visit us in Florida for the first time in the 90s, when we went to pick him up and we were excited, and he came around the corner and he had a suit on. It looked so out of place. I mean, it really looked out of place. Like the earth started moving like that. So when we met the sheikh, he was calm. Because he knew the people would be like that. And some of the people that knew of Muslims, they were judging the sheikh. And the sheikh, he has knowledge. He wasn't Muslim. He didn't have any uh, silk on. It was just a suit. But people were tough with him. No, you can wear that. You can wear those clothes in your profession. No problem. That's what your profession is. No problem. It's the culture. So just take it easy and learn how to work with these things. Pakistanis, Somalis, I'm a revert. I'm a revert. Your mother, your father, they speak Urdu. They speak whatever language, the Mirpuri language. That's what they speak. And they can't communicate with the revert. They can't communicate. The girl likes the boy, the boy likes the girl. And they hit it off well and they want to make it happen. But the family, maybe racism, maybe some of that. But also the culture, the culture. So if we say to the girl and the boy, don't do it. It's because of this issue. This issue. Pakistani boy, Pakistani boy. He marries a revert girl, a revert girl. Afro-Caribbean girl, white sister. He marries her. And now he wants to bring her to his parents' house where his three brothers are, and she's going to come in, she has to cook for everybody, and clean for everybody, and, and have me come, hey, 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 man, you need to move out and get your own house, or don't marry that girl, because to bring her into that situation is culturally difficult, whereas some other girl, she doesn't have a problem with that, she'll just deal with it and get on with business. So these issues of the culture are important. They are important. Okay, Juan, if you brothers have any questions, five minutes, inshallah, we'll deal with your questions. But before that, that, for those of you, most of you, if you look to your right over there in the corner right there, you see that brother shaking his head? That is Qais right there. Qais made uh, Hajj with me uh, this year, and he was in our room 2026. And those four brothers that I was with in that 2026, Qais, Captain uh, Captain Yassin, who was in the RAF, the Royal Air Force. He was a captain in the Royal Air Force. And we had, uh, who else was in there? Zuhaib, the young brother from uh, from Scotland. And one more person, Najm, Najmuddin, mashallah. And that other brother who was, and Zafar. So since I met those brothers and we spent a whole month together in our hotel room in Medina, and our hotel room in Mecca, uh, we developed a tremendous uh, close uh, uh, relationship. So as soon as he came in, I started thinking about la bake Allahumma la bake la bake la sharika la la bake. So may Allah Azza wa Jalla accept it. And also, Ikhwani, um, uh, his uh, mother-in-law, who embraced Islam, she was like Brother Dawood right here, was a former Hindu. She was a Sikh. She has three daughters. Two of them are twins. One is his wife and a younger one. All three of them embraced Islam. And then through the work of the brothers, this brother's Bangladeshi. She's Indian, Hindu, Sikh, Bangladeshi. The other husband's Somali. And the other one is Algerian. Through the efforts of those brothers, alhamdulillah, especially this brother, the mother became a Muslim. She's a Muslim now. So she's going for an operation that was supposed to be Tuesday, today actually, but they delayed it. So listen, I'm asking you guys, inshallah, 
to really make dua for her when you are um, are going to pray and just make general dua for um, the uh, lady that Allah gives her sabr and he makes this thing easy for her. Okay, guys, if you guys have any questions, you can put your questions for it. Father, yeah, Akhi. Yeah, you should follow that culture. If they want you and expect you to stay in that house, then you should follow that culture. And if you don't want to, you try to convince them. But if they don't want to buy into what you're saying and you're leaving, it's going to create a big problem, discord, animosity, enmity between you and your parents, then you should practice that particular culture because it doesn't go against the religion. As a matter of fact, the religion said, do everything to please your parents. Everything. Just don't lose your religion. Don't do what is haram. So if you have the ability to divorce your wife because your parents said it. The prophet didn't say it one to one time, two times, three. He said it multiple times to the man. His father or mother told him, divorce your wife. Umar said that to his son, Abdullah. Not just that. That's the famous incident. Happened multiple times. So whatever your parents tell you to do, if you can do it, do it. It's about your dunya, do it. Even if it's going to be difficult, do it. If you can do it. If you can't do it, then you don't have to do it. So in this case, that's the culture. I'm going to say to that brother, don't do it. People from Somalia, and I'm mentioning this because we have this problem. North, south, the boys in north, north, south, and there's problems. Don't do it. Try to get them to understand. If they don't want to understand, leave it. Leave it. Don't run off with them. Don't go to the masjid and get married with a wali and they take the wilaya from the father. Don't do it. All of these issues of the culture, they're what we're dealing with right now. Any more questions? And I just said Somali just as an example. And I think that most of our students who are Somali, they know what I'm talking about. We're not trying to put anybody down. Fadriyah. The question, Ahi. We said if the hadith, if the Quran and the Sunnah say something and the culture goes against it, then we're going to reject the culture. But what if the weak hadith is saying something and it goes against the culture, the weak hadith? If the weak hadith is weak and there's nothing to support it other than that weak hadith, then we throw it away. We throw it against the wall because it's not what the Prophet said. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. The ayah said, What the Prophet told you to take, take it, and what he told you, leave it alone, leave it alone. The Imam read the ayah of the Quran, Verily, the statement of the believers, when they are invited to be judged by what Allah revealed and His Messenger, they say, We hear and we obey. Provided, the Prophet said it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But if it's a weak hadith that has its support in the Quran, it's a weak hadith, it has its support in the hadith, it's a weak hadith, and it's true, the meaning, the meaning is true, then we're going to take it, right? Because every weak hadith, it is not necessarily, it's not true. It's not, it doesn't mean the, the jannah is under the feet of the mother. It's a weak hadith. But the meaning is true. One of the ways to get to the jannah. Most eloquent person who spoke with bald languages will fabricate it, but it's true. The meaning of the hadith, you see? Naam, akhi, tafadl. Good job, akhi. That's an excellent question. Excellent question. Sheikh al-Islam ibn Utaymi was really good in these issues like this. He comes to my mind because all of those ayat that tell you you have to feed people for mistakes that you made, Ibn Taymiyyah, he mentioned this goes back to the culture. He said also, the issue of how long should the journey be before you can start combining and shortening your prayers. There's nothing in the Quran that said that, nothing in the Sunnah that said that, nothing in the language of the Arabs that said that. Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah said, what determines the distance is... The culture of the people. 
What determines the distance? What determines whether you are a musafir or not a musafir is what the people consider. So traveling from here to London, although some people will say it only takes two and a half hours to get there, three hours on a decent day, no more than three hours. That's relatively easy. That's relatively easy. But we Muslims say, no, that's a journey. That's a trip. But when you're in London to get from uh, to get from Essex all the way over to uh, Kingston in London, that could take you two and a half hours itself. But the people of London don't consider themselves on a trip. The Muslims in London don't consider themselves on a trip. So we're going to say people who travel from Birmingham to there, they can shorten their prayer. But the people in London who will travel that same distance inside of London, they can't shorten because it's not about the distance. It's about what the two groups consider, what the Muslims consider to be the traveler, the musafir. No, no, because nothing in the religion said that. So if an individual is traveling every day, airplane driver, airplane pl- pilot, he's driving lorries long distance, he's doing deliveries every day, that's his job, every day. He drives from here to France, courier service, makes a delivery to France, France and he drives back every day, that's his job. Every day that he does that in the month of Ramadan, he doesn't have to fast. Every day, he doesn't have to fast. Because the Quran said, Mankana ala safarin, mankana minkum maridin or ala safarin fa iddatu min ayam ukhr. Anyone who's sick or he's traveling, you can make it up later. And Allah's, Allah didn't mention you have to be this much sick or that much sick. Allah didn't mention that. He said you're sick or you're a traveler. So which sickness? It's general. Which sickness? He bit his thing and now he has took out the cuticle in his thing and it really hurts. He was clipping his nails and he went too deep, too deep and pulled out the second toenail. You know the second one next to the lip? He pulled the whole thing out or the big one and he got it on the side. He said, I'm sick, I'm sick, I'm not fasting now. No, that's not what the ayat is talking about. That's not what the ayat is talking about. It's what the people consider to be sick. He's vomiting, he's dizzy, he has a migraine, he has a headache, he has a toothache. He sprained his ankle really bad and he has to take some uh, medication and so forth and so on. So, Ikhwani, this Urf issue, we're just touching the surface, surface and there's a lot of ikhtilaf in this as well. How do we determine the Urf, all that? We're not into that. This class is for what? Just a regular person giving regular people the importance of this issue to know as we live in Birmingham with our relatives and we work Pay attention to this issue of the culture. Pay attention to how to uh, deal with your families and your relatives. So when we say things like, we don't celebrate this and we don't do this and we don't do that, that's true, we don't do that. But that doesn't mean we have antisocial behavior from the, and we treat them bad and we don't visit them at all. No, we, we have to, we have to uh, uh, be people who know how to mix with people. Okay, we're going to stop here, inshallah. هذا وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على النبينا وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أخوان Sparkulous, okay. It's like Alam Rock. It's um. It's okay. It's not the ghetto ghetto like that. It's okay. It's it's, it's diverse. It's all right. okay. I think I think Sparkle is better than Small Heat though. Less crimes, less weed, less less antisocial behavior. You know. Sparkle is the rules of Do you want?